evening, everybody. Welcome to Zoom at Eight. My name is Julianne Peterson, and I am your host every Tuesday night. I am a loan officer for Old Capital Lending. You know, we are a premier provider of debt, especially in multifamily. Now, we'll do all the other asset classes, but we really are specialists in multifamily. So if you're looking for a lender, I'd love to look at the deal. I'm looking for your T12, your rent roll, an OM if they have it, and your underwriting. Send it over and we will underwrite it. Not just give you uh, you know, pie in the sky. We will actually underwrite it for exactly where those financials will fit with agency, with bridge, with bank. Any of those we can take care of for you. So every Tuesday night, we are here with industry experts. And tonight, it's going to be another great evening. We have Thomas Castelli in the house. He is with Hall CPA. Tonight, I'm so excited to introduce you to somebody who, he actually works for Hall CPA, Thomas Castelli. We have had uh, uh, another speaker from Hall CPA before, and they were super helpful. And so I thought I'd bring them back in. And right before we are going into a new year, I know for me, I make it known to myself and those around you that this year I'm going to minimize my taxes and I'm going to do everything possible. I'm going to set up all of these systems. And then it's another year down the road and I haven't had a strategy session and I, I have failed to improve my my position with my taxes. So I thought it would be great to have Hall CPA Thomas Costelli come in tonight and give us some some strategies, some some more understanding of the reps, uh, about cost segregation, about some of the changes that are going to be coming. So if you don't know Thomas Costelli, he's a CPA and a partner with Hall CPA. Um, who helps other real estate investors keep more of their hard-earned dollars in their pockets and out of the government's pockets through proactive tax strategies and planning. So tonight, we're going to hear all about that. Thomas, welcome to Zoom in 8. How are you tonight? Good, good. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here tonight. Well, it is so great to see you on Zoom at 8. We um, have industry experts like yourself three day, three weeks out of the month. And you share with us something that is just so profound that we can't do without either your services or the knowledge that you've shared with us. So I'm hoping tonight we can, in this downturn economy, what are the tax strategies that we need to know about? Um, you know, let's talk about first and foremost, for solo 401ks, IRAs, what can we be doing now to be bringing in the new year with either putting in those um, contributions today or before April 15th? Kind of walk us through some of those and the benefits of solo 401k, IRAs, Roth IRAs. Right. Ab absolutely. So I'll kind of start off with the IRA side of things, just to keep it simple, we'll dive into solo 401k. So first thing I want to say is you can have both a uh, an IRA and a solo 401k. It's possible to have both and contribute to both. So starting with the IRAs, the maximum contribution that you can make to an IRA account uh, this year is going to be $6,500. And if you're over the age of 50, that's going to be $7,500. Now there's two types of IRAs. There's the Roth IRA and there's the traditional IRA. A traditional IRA is tax deductible if you're under certain income limits, but once you're over those income limits, the traditional IRA, you can still contribute to it, but you're not going to be able to get a deduction. Whereas with a Roth IRA, Roth IRAs, you're making the contribution with after-tax dollars. All right. Now, if you're over certain income, uh, income limits, you're not going to be able to make that contribution directly to the Roth IRA. Now, the difference before I get into like kind of the limits there, the let me just kind of explain what the difference is why you might want to make a Roth contribution to an IRA versus a regular contribution. So when you make a contribution to a Roth account, the money goes in after tax, 
And then uh, when you ultimately w- withdraw the money in retirement, it is tax free. So for many investors, it's going to be more advantageous to make a Roth IRA contribution. However, if your modified adjusted gross income, also known as MAGI, is above 153000 then you start to phase out of being able to actually contribute to a Roth. So that's when we get into the backdoor Roth. So the backdoor Roth is when you contribute to a traditional IRA, and then you roll it over into a Roth. So interestingly, I, I don't actually know why they haven't just done away with the income limit on the Roth yet, because Congress has effectively blessed this strategy where you make that contribution to the traditional IRA and you immediately roll it over to a Roth. So say, for example, you were to make a contribution to a $6,500 contribution to your traditional IRA, you can turn around and immediately, like literally the next minute and roll it right over to the Roth. And now you have it in the Roth account. And you would, if you're going to use that strategy, if you if you're going to use that Roth back to a Roth, it'd be more beneficial to you to simply just flip it right to the Roth account right away, and then make the investment through the Roth account. Then it would be to do it through the traditional account and then let it grow, and then later try to flip it over. And the reason for that is if you put it in the traditional account and it starts growing. Then what happens is there's like a proration of the first of all you you're still going to get, you're going to get taxed on the conversion the earnings not the contributions but the amount that the amount of earnings that, had, that the amount it's grown is going to be taxable when you make that conversion so you're better off just making that conversion right away so you know in terms of what you should be doing at the end of this year for the IRA you're in no rush when it comes to IRAs you have actually until the individual tax filing deadline of April 15th to make the contribution to the IRA. So you're in absolutely no rush. You could make it now, or you could wait till January 15th. You could wait till April 14th of 2024 to make that contribution. But uh, for for the most part, I'd imagine most people in this room are probably going to be looking, wanting to do that Roth conversion option simply because you're probably phased out of that threshold where the traditional tax deductible. And that's where the real benefit of having a traditional is. So just fl- just basically can make the contribution to your traditional account, flip it right over to the Roth. That's kind of how the IRA works. So if we have an IRA from a company that we used to work for, and it, it was a 401k, it switches to the IRA. Could you do that same idea where you put it into an, you switch it from that 401k to an IRA and then flip it right into the uh, the Roth IRA? Yeah. So say for, yeah, absolutely. So say for example, you, you had a job, you left the job. Now you have this old 401k kind of just sitting there. You ended up rolling it over into a traditional. You can roll that traditional account over into the Roth. Mind you that the earnings will still be, you know, you, if you have earnings, like the amount above your contributions will still be taxable, but it's, you could do that. Con- you could do that rollover. Likewise, you could roll over the 401k right over into you could do that you could do the rollover right into the roth right from the 401 from the 401k oh oh, you could from the onset okay all right interesting so forget going to the traditional just go right into the roth ira is what you're saying you had said that earlier yeah so that's kind of it's kind of uh, that's kind of uh the ira side of things now, when you get into a solo 401, 401k, uh, those are for solo 401ks are for self-employed individuals. So in order to have one, you have to have self-employment income and you can typically generate self-employment income from an active business that you're running. If, if you're doing like consulting or you have a, a, a medical practice or a dental practice or other type of business, you're not going to be typically, you're not going to be able to generate um income from rental properties that you can contribute to a solo 401k. But solo 401ks for for owner for business owners have some significant upside. The maximum contribution you could do for the year is $66,000, which is pretty substantial and that will be tax deductible if you make it to a traditional solo 401k account, right? And uh if you you could also make uh contributions to a Roth so, uh, solo 401k account. Um the interesting thing that differ where where it differs where the IRA differs the traditional IRA differs from the differs from the r- traditional four hundred one k 
is it's ta- is the solo 401k is tax deductible regardless of how much income you generate. So if you made just for so if you made that sixty six thousand dollars and uh, into if you made that contribution to the solo 401k, you can deduct that if your income is two hundred k or if it's a million bucks, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so that's kind of uh, why a lot of people end up making large contributions to solo 401ks is because it's tax deductible. It's a so traditional. What program. if your self-employed your company doesn't make any money, but you have a large tax return? Could um, you take that tax return and put it into uh, like the tax solo- refund? Yeah. Uh, so. Typically, no. Um, the reason for that is you need to have earned income. That's that, or you need to, you need to have self employment income. Is the the more technical term, and self employment income is income where you you're charged where you get taxed the fifteen point three percent self employment tax, which is Medicaid, uh, which is Social Security and Medicare. So uh, just to draw a comparison, I know my, people in the room might have different backgrounds. Um, if you have a job, you're paying seven point. Uh, Sorry, 7.53, I'm pretty sure it's 7.53%, no, 7.65%, I'm sorry, per, uh, of your income in Social Security, Medicare, your employer's paying the other half. When you're self-employed, you're paying both sides for, 15, for a total of 15.3%. So that's the type of income that you have to have uh, generating in order to make solo 401k contributions. Now, there's two parts to solo 401k contributions. The first part is the considered the quote-unquote employee portion. And the employee portion for this for 2023 uh, is twenty two thousand is twenty two thousand five hundred dollars. That's the max you can make on the employee side. And uh, you have if you're going to make those solo four hundred and one k contributions on the employee side, you have to make that before the year ends, right? So before twelve thirty one twenty twenty three. So that part's timely. Uh, the remaining amount is going to be considered the employer contribution. And you can make that contribution up until the tax filing deadline. So you do have some room in there on the employer side, but the employee a portion needs to be made by the end of this year. So that's something you would just need to know about. Great, great piece. On that remaining from the employer, what is the max on that? Or is it a percentage? How, does, how is that figured? Yeah, it's a great question. So it, it depends on the type of business that you're, that you're running, but it's going to typically be 25% of your compensation. So uh, I have a calculator here that will kind of put us in, in the number. So say, say for example, um, your business generated $200,000 and just in net income and profit, just for the sake of this example, um, in this case, you'd have the you'd have the employee contribution of 22,500, and then you'd be able to make an employer contribution of $37,477.89. And that was calculated by the employee contribution that that portion you just make kind of into that plan because you already have enough profits or earnings of self-employment income to make that. Now, from there, uh, your your employer contribution will be made, which will represent the other half. And there's, there's some calculations in here with with it, it's the net earnings from self-employment is how it's kind of calculated. I'm not going to get too much into that detail. If you want a calculator on this, you can actually go to the obliviousinvestor.com. It's called, it's actually a really um, interesting uh, name for a website, but uh, you could just uh, Google uh, oblivious investor solo 401k calculator, and it'll give you a calculator on exactly how to calculate it. But it's basically based off the employee, the employer contribution is based off a percentage of your total profits. Okay. Now, I know Paula, thank you, Paula, for putting that into um, the chat. Um, Paula, you were mentioning that you think this is active income. Can you kind of talk about that? Yes, in the in the chat, Charles Lemire was asking, is he talking about passive or active? And I think he's talking about active income. Yeah, yeah. His employees. Is that correct, Thomas? Yeah, this, this has to be active income or, or self-employment income. So income you're generating from an active trader business this is not rental. If rental income does not help here. Um, this has to be active income. So like in the context of real estate, like it's flipping, uh, wholesaling, uh, consulting, uh, fees from a syndication, like 
like the acquisition fee um, or the asset management fees, the fees you're generating are typically uh, subject to a self-employment taxes. So that can help you, but not the rental income that you're generating. Got it. Good, good, good stuff. All right. Now, what happens if you decide in this market, we can no longer be self-employed and we need to go and get a W-2 job and you have a solo 401k? How do you manage that? Right. So at that point, technically, uh, like when you look at the technical details, you're supposed to shut down your solo 401k and roll it over and in, in, presumably into an IRA um, within a year of you shutting down your operations. You're technically not supposed to have that solo 401k open unless you're conducting business. So that's uh, that's the te technically how it works um, with the solo 401k. Um, so you, what some people will do to like kind of maintain their solo 401k is do some type of consulting right? Um, so they are generating like a minimal amount of self-employment income in order to like be able to keep that solo 401k open. Um, because I think someone mentioned in the chat, there is some benefits to having a solo 401k if you're investing in syndicates and funds, real estate, uh, specifically syndicates and funds as a limited partner. Because if you were to invest in say a multi, just for example, a multifamily syndicate, and you were to put that in an IRA, a self-directed IRA, you're going to be subject to uh, UDFI, which is the unrelated, uh, excuse me, uh, UDFI is unrelated debt financed income. So because like long story short, I'm not going to get too much into the details here. Uh, the IRS and the powers that be did not want like a tax advantage account, like a, like a solo 401k, or like, excuse me, like an IRA to compete with regular businesses because they're tax exempt. So if you're generating income, uh, if you're using debt financing to acquire a property, a portion of the income generated by that property is going to be considered UDFI and it's subject to a tax called the unrelated business income tax. It's usually pretty small and pretty minor uh, for most investors. I've seen it you know, not really impact returns too much, maybe a few percentage points. But uh, if you can avoid, you could actually avoid that by investing in a solo 401k, you're not going to be subject to that UDFI tax when you're in a solo 401k, which is why uh, many real estate investors prefer to have that vehicle if they're going to be investing in syndicates and funds as a limited partner, because they get to avoid that entire tax and all the, the administrative you know, pains that come with it, like filing the 1099 um, the 1099. I, I can't believe I forgot the name of the form. I think it's pretty, I'm pretty sure it's the 1099 R that needs to go 1099, excuse me, the 990 T that's the form that needs to be filed when you have, uh, when you have UDFI and it's just uh, very hard to find people who file it for you. And it's just a pain to do yourself. So many people just prefer to go with that, that other vehicle. I think that from the people that have come to zoom at eight, who've spoken on solo 401ks and SDIRAs that they seem to think that the trustees or the custodians don't do a real good job of explaining it to people, you know, like the 5,500 uh, filings that you have to, to do the UDFI. There's also the UBIT tax and how that all um, plays into this. Yeah, you know, it, it's it, it's one of those things like if you're a solo for, excuse me, if you're an IRA custodian, like you're trying to, you know, can I'm not, nothing wrong with IRA custodians. They do, they, you know, they they have businesses to run, but you're trying to make a sale and they're not necessarily going to try to throw up this big blocker in the middle of their sale. And on top of that, it's actually really complicated to explain. Yeah. So um, sometimes they'll gloss over it and, or tell you to go speak to your CPA about it, but some custodians will walk you through it and show you exactly how it is. I've certainly had, uh, custodians that we've worked with that have been very transparent about how it works and very helpful in explaining, uh, to people, you know, what they're getting themselves into. Okay. So I, I think I, I've got a good sense of the solo 401k. I think you've done a brilliant job of explaining it to us in terms of a Roth do you call it a Roth solo 401k? Is that how you? Yeah. I, it's yeah. I guess you could call it that. I mean, it comes in two okay. different flavors. Yeah. The Roth. Okay. So, uh, so the traditional 401k, you get a tax deduction when you make the contribution when it, with a Roth version, you don't get the tax deduction when you make the contribution, but the earnings, when you 
when you're able to withdraw them, uh, you know, in retirement are are going to be tax free. So there is a trade off there. There's certainly a trade off there. Uh, some people, um, there's definitely a debate on which one's better. Everybody who I talk to believes that they're going to be making more money when they're in retirement than they are now, and uh, that may or may not be the case for everybody. So you have to take if you're in your higher. Uh, to be honest, it's probably in your younger years, you might be in your higher earning years, might be better make that uh, deduction, take that contribution, yeah, take the, you know, make this regular deduction, take the contribution, uh, excuse well, me, make the contribution. Yeah. With the, uh, oh, sorry, let me back this up. What I'm trying to say is make the regular, um, con- make the regular contribution, take the deduction today, take the tax savings from that contribution and go invest it elsewhere because you don't know what's going to happen in retirement. And, uh, you know, that that's kind of my personal philosophy on it in general, but it depends on it. Definitely depends on on people's situations. Okay, that makes sense. So, do I go back to the same custodian to set up the solo Roth IRA? Is that uh, who? It, yeah, I mean, it it definitely depends. Some custodians do it all. Some custodians focus on certain things, but most okay. IRA custodians or most self-directed account custodians will help you with either with a solo 401k, whether you want it to be traditional or Roth, or if you want to set up like an, an IRA, they could typically help you with both if that's what you want to do. Now, having said that, you could also go set up the, you could also set up these accounts with most like just traditional uh, custodians like a Fidelity or like yes. a Charles Schwab. That's also- But they wouldn't possible. do the solo 401k. <laughs> From from my under, from from my experience, you typically need to go to a specialist for that. Yeah. But you can okay. go get the the regular account uh, okay. from the regular accounts from you know the the traditional people, the traditional brokerage you would expect. Okay, Charles Lemire says, can you suggest a reasonable priced way to generate a ten ninety nine R? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, can you explain it so that people who don't know what that means? So uh, the form 1099R is for people who basically uh, you've made a distribution from from one of your from one of your accounts. Now, this is kind of a tough question to answer because most of the time, in, in my experience, uh, the the companies will kind of handle this for you. The 1099R. Uh, so you would have to if you if your custodian's not helping you with this you would probably have to go to a CPA to do it or you'd have to do it yourself so a reasonably priced way to do it is i guess you'd have to shop around to a CPA you know to a CPA to a tax professional who would be able to do it at a price point you you believe is fair for it um i don't we don't see this too often so i i don't know that i i i have a good answer for that particular question interesting all right um Charles, have you paid for a to, uh, a company to generate your 1099R? And did. what did you pay? About 400. Okay. And it was a lot more than I expected to, and I was a little ticked. Yeah, and it's just like one form. <clears throat> and can you get that done by your regular CPA? Well, like if you think of the 550, which you can do online for the uh, IRS, right. I was hoping... There was a similar mechanism for the um, 1099R, but I couldn't find one. So I was sunk and I don't happen to own Acrobat Writer. So off I went. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, $400. You're making so much on your returns, but that's not where you want it to go. Okay. So um, we have Paula has a question for a typical investor who is at the end of the year and he needs additional deductions or he needs additional deductions that are easy to get tax credits for, what is the quick investment that you can give tax credits, that that can give tax credits? One way is to invest in oil and gas, right? Or what are the other ones? So, yeah. So I think we're talking about maybe two different things, tax deductions and tax credits. So Mm -hmm. tax deductions, a tax deduction will reduce the income that you're paying tax on, whereas a tax credit will reduce the tax that you're actually paying. And for the most part, tax deductions is uh what he, oh, let me let me give you some of both okay so the tax deductions uh year end some of them are if you own a business 
um, would be to purchase, perhaps purchase a vehicle. And I know, so I think I saw somebody else ask, ask, ask this question. So I'm going to give that quick breakdown if, if it's okay with everybody. Um, if you purchase a vehicle that is used more than 50% for business um, and weighs more than 6,000 pounds, it's called the gross vehicle weight rating, the GVWR, you're able to use bonus depreciation on that vehicle. So to kind of give you a quick overview of what a quick example that would look like. Say you purchased a Ford F-150 for $60,000. Just kind of picking a, a net number out of a hat here. Uh, and say you use that 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 vehicle 75% for business. Well, now $45,000 of that vehicle is going to be eligible for bonus depreciation because you use 75% for business. You must multiply that by 60000 and that's how you get to 45000 Now you're going to multiply this by 80% because that's the amount of bonus depreciation that's eligible for in, in 2023. And you're looking at a tax deduction of $36,000. Now, interestingly, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll buy it, you know, closer to the end of the year, kind of around the time maybe we are now, or maybe early December, and only drive it for business purposes for the first year. And when you drive it only for bit, you know, that means you have a hundred percent business use for the first year, which means that in this example we're looking at here, the entire sixty thousand dollars would be eligible for bonus depreciation, the entire purchase price. And now you're looking at a deduction of around $48,000 for the year. So that's one of the more powerful ways to do something at year end simply because yes. vehicles cost so much. Now, there's one more there's one caveat here I do want to to mention um is that you do have to use the vehicle for more than 50% for business purposes for the next 5 years to avoid recapturing some of this depreciation. If you use it less than that, you have to recapture some of it. And it's a really complicated calculation not going to go through it, but it, it just something to note. If you're planning to use the strategy, ideally, this is a, a vehicle that you're using for business purposes and plan to and can uh, practically use for business purposes uh, going forward and not just to to buy it and just get this deduction you know, at the end of the year. So that's, that's one. Yeah, that's a big one. Could you buy it and uh, write it off? 48,000 and sell it and do the same thing the next year? Or would you have a recapture at that? Yeah, you would, okay. you would effectively, yeah, you'd have to pay recapture if you okay. and, and you would, you would pay recapture based on the sales price, whatever you sell it for uh, minus whatever remaining cost basis you have in the vehicle that next year. So I, I would not, I cannot recommend doing that um, or planning to do that. If something happens and you have to do it, it is what it is. But um, yeah, I wouldn't. It wouldn't be. Uh, it wouldn't be something I'd advise to do. Perfect. What other but, ideas? Oops. Who's that? But but but, oh, uh, but Thomas, isn't it true that you could prove that you used the vehicle for more than fifty percent of the time for real estate if you kept a travel log that documented where, you know, the, the mileage that you that you incurred, the location of where you're going, the purpose of what you're doing. I mean, they could prove it that way, could they not? Oh yeah, no, you we could definitely do that. Oh yeah, no, for sure. You could definitely, uh, you, that's how you would prove how you use the vehicle is the mileage log. And if you have the mileage log in future years, you can have, that's absolutely something you need to, you'd want, you need to basically keep to prove that business usage. I guess, I, I guess what I'm saying is you wouldn't want to buy it this year, use it hundred percent for business and then just turn around and sell it next year. Yeah. Um, because that would, you're just, you're, 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 you're robbing Peter to pay. You're kind of robbing your, uh, you I'm trying to use a good well, analogy. To pay Paul. Can you right. tell me if 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 the the for the life of that individual vehicle, um, because it, is there is there only one time that the owner of the vehicle could make that that claim for bonus depreciation? Yeah, it would be in that so first. Have to, how do they how do they prove that? If say if you buy this car used and it's from another business owner and they already claimed it. You see what I'm saying? I'm just, how do they yeah. figure that out? Yeah, that's a great question. So the car can be new or used. It just has to be new to you. So you can go to a used car dealership, buy a used F4150. I'm just using this car as an example. Yes. Um, but, uh, and you can deduct it. doesn't matter if the previous owner deducted it. Now okay. you can, you can only deduct it one time though. Like once you buy the car, it's in the first year that you buy the car, it's going to be eligible for, for bonus depreciation. And that's the year that you would use it. Once you use it, it's that's that's the bonus depreciation is done. You can't take it again. 
You could okay. purchase it. You could. Here's what you could do. You could purchase another car this next year and use that car for more than 50% for business and still maintain more than 50% business usage on the car you bought this year. So you could have two cars in use mm -hmm. for business. But See, these, these cars, just because they weigh a lot, I mean, they can also be hybrids or Teslas. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah, you, and it doesn't yeah. have to be a gas guzzler just because it weighs a lot. Right, 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 right. You the, the key here is making sure it has a gross vehicle weight rating of over 6,000 pounds. And usually you can, when you're shopping for cars, you can Google if the car has that gross vehicle weight rating. And when you go to the dealership, it's on it, the gross vehicle weight rating is typically on the sticker on that the, the door. When you open up the door, if not, you could verify it with the uh, sales, you know, the, the, whoever sells you the car. I would just, you know, double, I would double check just to make sure. But, uh, but yeah, so that's the key. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be Ford F one fifty. I think, if I'm not mistaken, a, a, a Tesla Model X has a yes, gross vehicle Tesla weight Model rating X. of six thousand two hundred. Put a link to some of those cars in the chat, guys. Yeah. So, I mean, that's probably, that's probably the biggest one next to making a uh, solo 401k contribution or making a contribution to, you know, that you can make to a deductible retirement account. So another one, can you give us one more uh, tax deduction that would be good before the end of the year? Anything yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Another one is like, if you have any equipment that you need to buy, um, you can buy it by the end of the year, for example. Um, Trying to give a good example of what this might be. Um, you know, a lot of printer. social media people, a lot, excuse me? A printer. Sorry. Right. Printers, computers. Uh, if you if you know you need a new computer in 2024, buy it now. If you, if you, that's one way you could deduct it this year. Uh, computers, by the way, if, if you're using them more than 50%, you could deduct the entire thing. So they are like, they could deduct the entire thing for vehicle, for um, computers specifically. Um, so that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good thing to buy. And like printers, like cameras, if you need cameras for, for reasons, uh, things like that. Does it have to be over $500 for cost basis? Is that what they're looking for, for capitalization of it? Um, so most of these items are going to be either a, so equip, so most equipment like computers are going to, you're going to be able to use what's known as the, the de minimis safe harbor which allows you to immediately expense the items if they're under um, an invoice line item of $2,500 or less, so 2500 you'll be able to immediately expense it. And even if it's over that amount, computers specifically qualify for 100% bonus depreciation. Excuse me, not 100%, 80% well, 80 this year qualify for bonus depreciation, so you can bonus depreciate it. And is that 60% next year? Yes. Yeah, bonus depreciation, okay. yep, phasing out, it's going to be 60% next year. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, I think we said this. Can the company also contribute to the solo Roth 401 besides a participant? Can a company also contribute to the solo 401k? Yeah, I think we I think we might have I think we, we might have covered this a little bit. I think so. Um it, so there's two parts of the of the solo 401k contribution. There's the employee side, 22,500. and then there's the remaining amount would be made by the company and uh, the 22,500 has to be made by the end of this year. So by 1231, 2023, the uh, company can make their contribution up to the filing deadline. So they do have the but company. Has solo to 401k. Right. It's for solo 401k. What about Roth? Solo 401k. Yeah. Uh, same, same thing. Same thing. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Does the Roth 401k have an RMD at a certain yes. age? Yes. Yes. What is they, RMD? An RMD is a, a required minimum distribution. So basically, when you reach a certain retirement age, let's see what it is this year, kind of alters a little bit. Don't deal with uh, uh, RMDs too much. But basically, when you reach a certain age this year, it's going to be um, 73 if you reach age 72 after December 31st, 2022. You're required to ta start taking out an amount out of your 401ks on a regular, on an annual basis. Like you, they basically force you to make these withdrawals, so you can't just let the money sit there in the in the 401k. I don't have, I don't know exactly why they did that. I have to imagine so you don't accumulate these huge accounts and just pass them on to your heirs tax free. 
That's that would be my guess, but you, that's what a required minimum distribution is. Got it. Okay. Let's talk about people that have active income that are not that have passive income as well, but they're not real estate professionals. There is this idea of oh, just buy one single family short term rental. Can you walk us through that? Because there are a lot of people that think they're getting into multifamily and they're going to get the K-1s. They can write it off because everybody talks about that. And they come to find out on their taxes that no, 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 that doesn't yeah. work for you. Does work for somebody who is self-employed. Yeah, so could, help us out with that. Yeah, I, I could break it down like this because this is a kind of a multifaceted thing with the real estate professional status in there too. So let me let me let me start here. Let me start here. So before the Tax Reform Act of 1986, you would be able to buy a rental property or invest in a syndicate as a limited partner. And if that syndicate or fund or or the, your rental property generated losses, uh, which are typically generated by the non-cash expense or largely generated by the non-cash expense called depreciation. So depreciation, uh, we, we've talked about it a little bit here, but basically uh, it reduces your taxable income without necessarily reducing your cash flow because it only really exists on paper. So uh, what investors would do before 1986 is they just buy properties and invest in these syndicates and just take these losses against their their active income, no questions really asked. But it was really controversial. So the Tax Reform Act of 1986 introduced Section 469 of the tax code, which is known as the Passive Activity Rules. The Passive Activity Rules did was it made all like income generating activities passive or non-passive. And uh non-passive is is the activities you you're you're where you're actively involved things like an active business right maybe you're doing consulting or maybe you're fixing fl flipping properties or income you have from a job now on the passive side um passive they made all rental activities passive by default uh, which means they were just automatically passive did not matter how much time you spent on those rental activities they're passive um now the issue with passive act passive activities is the losses from passive activities can only offset the income or capital gains from other passive activities. Um, so if you have a rental property that generates a significant loss, you typically cannot use that loss to offset your active income or your self income from a job or business that you're running. So uh, in this context, if you buy a rental property, you're not going to be able to use those losses. Or if you invest in a syndicate, you get a, a, a K-1 and those losses on your K-1 show up in your K-1, they're typically not going to be able to offset your active income. So there is kind of two ways to kind of get around this rule. From It's three ways. I'll go through three ways. The first way is if you have income under, uh, if your modified adjusted gross income is under 100000 you can deduct up to $25,000 of these losses against your active income. And now you have to be actively involved. So this won't work for limited partners, but if you own the property directly and you're making decisions, like you're hiring a property manager, you're approving repairs and maintenance, you're going to be able to use this. Now that deduction decreases $1 for every $2 of modified adjusted gross income above 100,000 until it completely phases out 150. So once you're at $150,000 of modified just gross income, you can no longer deduct anything. But just kind of give an example of like, what if you were in the middle of the road, right? What if you made $125,000 in modified adjusted gross income? Well, then you'd be able to deduct 12,500 because it phases out $1 for every $2 above 100 till you get to 150. So that's kind of how it works. Um, that's one way. The next way is if you qualify as a real estate professional. So the real estate professional status allows you to take the losses from your rental properties against your active or your non-passive income. Now, that's what a lot of investors want. They don't want their losses to be trapped in this passive bucket because sure, it can offset other passive income you have like rental losses, but you want to be able to use that today to offset your non-passive income. So... Uh, to qualify as a real estate professional, you need to spend more than 750 hours and, and this is the, the, the tough part, and 
more than half your total working time in real property trades or businesses. So um, basically, uh, this is really challenging. This is virtually impossible. It's been proven virtually impossible to do if you have a W, if you're working a job. The IRS considers a job to be 2,080 hours per year. And in order to spend more than half your total working time in real estate, you'd have to spend 2,081 hours or more in real estate, which is uh, roughly 81 hours per week, every week for the entire year. And there's been no one who's been able to be really uh, uh, survive tax court and the IRS and be able to prove that they did that. There's one gentleman, there's one tax mm -hmm. court case where he was a part-time pilot and was able to he had you know really good uh proof that he spent less than 2080 hours basically at his job and uh he was able to qualify but uh he was one of one of of many only one of many who were able to do that so um that that's uh that's kind of the real estate professional status now what many people do um, is they they hear about all this and they're like, well, what can I do next? And they hear about the short-term rental loophole, it's called. And the reason why it's called the loophole is, is, is I'll explain in a second here. Um, all rental activities, quote unquote, are passive by default. But underneath the tax code, there's a regulation that says that if you have a, a property that has an average period of customer use of seven days or less, or 30 days or less, and you provide substantial services to your guests, which are like hotel like services like daily cleaning, daily meals, concierge services, things like that. It is not a quote unquote rental activity. Instead, it's treated like a normal business. And now it's not passed by default. So if you materially participate in that property, um, and material participating means you passed one of the seven tests that you can use to prove material participation. But for the majority of investors who would be looking to use this strategy, you're really looking at three. You're looking at, did you spend more than 500 hours on your short-term rental for the year? Um, and our experience has been challenging for investors to do that with a short-term rental. The next one is you spend, you do substantially everything. So in other words, you're a one-person show. You do just about everything yourself. Uh, and the third one is you spend, and the most popular one, and at least in my experience, has been you spend more than 100 hours on the activity uh, or on your short-term rental, and no one spends more time than you. And what this allows you to do is hire cleaners, hire uh, repair people, and kind of like manage the property remotely. And when you do that, you have that average stay of seven days or less or 30 days or less with substantial services, and you materially participate. The losses on this are now non-passive on that short-term rental and only your short-term rentals where you meet these requirements. Um, and a lot of people hear about that and decide, Hey, look, I, I really want these losses, especially at the end of the year, although I can't recommend trying to buy a short-term rental at this point in the year and making this work because in order to make this strategy work, you need to actually have guests stay at the property. Guests need to stay at the property in order to prove the seven days or less, which is what most people will go for. And, um, uh, that that's kind of how this works in a nutshell. So like uh, one more thing I'll just add in there, uh, real estate professional status, that's going to be for people who are actively involved in real estate on, it's basically effectively your full-time job, right? Because 750 hours and more than half your total working time. You could do that if you just own rental properties and that's what you do. You can do that if you're a real estate agent or broker, com brokers commonly qualify. If you're in development, if you're in construction, if you're fixing and flipping, if you're in wholesaling, if you're a syndicator and you're doing that on effectively on a full-time basis, those are types of you know positions, I guess you would say, or occupations where situations where you'd be able to qualify as a real estate professional. I tell you, it's a lot of people use this. It's a great method. You have to make sure that you obviously hit all those those terms. Now on that short-term rental, there's three uh details do they have you have to hit each one of those or two of three yeah that's a great question um it's just one just, just one, one only okay. one and uh yeah most people most the, the vast majority of people who i know use this strategy are going for that 100 hours and making sure that they spend more than 100 hours and no one else spends more time than them amazing so just to reiterate because i think this is this gets lost in some of our webinars folks 
we all talk about doing cost seg, and I think it's important to do. When you have an active investor who is passive in your deal, they're, and, and Thomas, you need to make sure I'm saying this right. You're putting that kind of on the shelf. They don't, you don't get to write that off on the, your taxes if you are a passive investor with active income or am I saying that? I know I'm not necessarily yeah. saying that correctly, but. You know, you, you, you said that right. You said that right. So if you invest as a limited partner um, or you invest in a rental property that you're not, and you're not a real estate professional, the losses generated mostly by depreciation are not going to be able to offset your non-passive income. So that's income from a job, a business, an active business that you're running. And also, interestingly, and some people, and I, and I just want to, this is almost counterintuitive, but um, capital gains and dividends from the the sale of stocks, bonds, mutual funds are in the non-passive bucket. Believe it or not, they are considered non-passive. And the IR, the tax code is very clear on this. They say that income from these sources shall be treated as not from a passive activity. So, in other words, they say they're non-passive. Um, but, uh, that's what's in the non-passive bucket. Okay. So non-passive, so active. So right. you have a loss on your stock broker, um, your, your account, it is taken, you, you can write that off as a loss. Um, well, so, so if you had, let's say, no, if you're not a real estate professional, you couldn't right. like, right. You could not yet. Okay. All right. So I, I'm a real estate professional. I have lost on my, uh, on my stock market account. I can write that off. Correct. Right. If you're a real estate professional, right. Interesting. Okay. That, well, that's well, let, interesting. Let, let me, let me clarify that there. Cause I think, I, okay. I, um, so what I, what I meant to say, say you have a loss from your rental property, right? Um, that loss, if you're not a real estate professional cannot offset your gains on the sale of stocks. But if you are a real estate professional, it can. However, you can't take the losses from your stocks and use it to offset your your active income if you are a real estate professional. So the max you could deduct on your stocks is capital gains three thousand dollars per year against your non passive income. Wow, I don't know how you keep this all organized in your head because it I is just, crazy, crazy complicated. Just I just I just done this just done this so much. It just it's hard to forget at this point. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, all right, let's open it up. Uh, you have been amazing with all this information. Anybody in the room have a question for Thomas? I got a quick question, Julie. Yes, yes. Hey, I Thomas, good to see you. Um, is there any benefit that is uh, offered from low-income properties such as the, the LITEC uh, type properties? Yeah, so the L-I-T-C-H, yeah. So, um, yeah. There is a the, you do de, you do get tax credits for that um, from those properties. Now, the interesting thing about those tax credits are if you're a real estate professional, then you can take the tax credits pretty much without you know pretty much without limits. Um, but if you're not a real estate professional, um, it's going to be so. If you're a passive investor, in other words, those credits are going to be limited to the amount you can deduct. And this is going to be really a kind of this might this might be hard to explain. So I, it, the amount you could deduct is 20, you could deduct. Okay. This is the way it's calculated. So say you had, um, the amount of credits you're going to deduct is what $25,000 multiplied by your tax bracket would be. So say, for example, you're in the 37% tax bracket, the amount of tax credits you can take as a passive investor from LITCH tax credits would be nine thousand two hundred fifty dollars that's the max credit you could take because you could take 20 it's basically a twenty five thousand dollar deduction that multiplied by your 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 tax bracket will give you the amount you can deduct if you're a passive investor using litch credits wow but the that's not very that's not very helpful <laughs> that is amazing I, i've never heard that before i thought it went on to for the property itself but it's also for the investors so why wouldn't people be looking at this as real estate professionals? This is a huge deal. Plus, you get the cost seg on on top of that as well, as well, right? 
the ITCH. I think it's because uh, I, I don't, I've not looked too much into the actual like investment aspects of this to, to know for sure. But my understanding is that they, they limit the amount of credits yeah. that are given out and you have to basically compete to try to get these credits. So they're not, uh, so the, the government basically, uh, controls who gets the credits or like, you know, divvies it out. So it's not something that everybody may be able to just get access to. Okay. And they don't have a great back end, Julie, so far from what I'm seeing that they don't have a great back end exit because you're limited on how much you can rent, raise rent. So you just, it's That's a nice true. cash flow play. Okay. Good point. Good point. Who else? Anybody else have a question? At Thomas the disposition of a property, you also get to take that depreciation. As a non-passive. As a non-passive. Yes, I'm a I'm not a real estate professional. Right. So the, the way the way that this works is when you sell a property, the passive losses are unlocked to the extent of your to the extent of the gain. Well, okay, it depends. Okay, it's just okay. So let me break it down like this. So when you sell a property, if there's any losses that are still remaining that are passive that are suspect. So let me start here. So when you oh, have oh, hold on, let me let me suggest that if I sell one, I buy another one and get the depreciation off the new one which then allows me to unlock that new depreciation almost immediately. And that's the one that gives me the kick. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're talking about is the lazy 1031 exchange strategy. Some people call it basically what happens is if you, because the new property, you go ahead, you join, you, you, uh, you go ahead, you purchase it, you run the cost seg study on it. You generate these losses, you claim bonus depreciation. You're going to have what they call current year suspended as uh, current year passive yeah. losses. These current year losses can now offset the capital gain on the sale of that other rental property. And some people have called it the lazy 1031 exchange because you're effectively getting what a 1031 exchange would give you without actually doing a 1031 exchange. What I seem to have found is it also just mixes in with all my active income. And I can actually, or I have done Roth conversions at a much cheaper rate because of this. Yeah. So, yeah. So in that, in that scenario, what happens is the way it works on your tax return is ultimately, it ultimately that loss is ultimately treated as non-passive in that scenario. Yeah. Um, one of our, one of the members of our firm calls it, consider it, calls it uh backdoor reps. That's what he calls it because it's affected your, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of, you're kind of getting that benefit, but it's not, um, it's yeah. Long story short, it can be done. All right, I'm glazing over now, so let's minimize that. Uh, we don't want to put too many people in a, a head spin. Um, anybody else? Was that Alex? Did you want to ask a question? I wasn't sure if you got. Um, I did, but you okay. muted me. Sorry, you just, I wasn't <laughs> sure if you, were, if you were having some issues behind you. So no, I so slightly off tang tangent so in terms of for a solo 401k investments into the syndications i have heard of strategy where the syndication interest because of the uh, limited liquidity and lack of control gets a discount up to 60 percent and using that strategy roll over to solo Roth 401k would be at discount and coupled with the depreciation would clearly provide the benefit. Yeah, I, I, I've heard of that being done yes. before. It's not something that, that I've, that I've been a part of it, it but I've heard of people basically, I, I, I see what you're saying there. You're basically, you have, it, you have it in a traditional account, right? And then you're basically, right. you're devaluing it because you're the lack, you're getting a professional valuate, a valuation done on the on it. And they're saying, because you don't have the control, it's not valued Correct. at its true fair market value. Correct. Value 60% less and you're, you're able to move it over and minimize, minimize or potentially eliminate tax issues. Uh, I've heard of that before. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen it done before. It's not something I've been personally, uh, a part of okay. so i can't i can't comment much more beyond, beyond that got it thank you amazing 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 i mean i think we need to have you back because there's just so many details that you've been so generous to share with us let's see if we've got one last question before we close up tonight you guys this has been amazing thomas you are 
so knowledgeable of all this. Anybody else have a question? I have a question, Julie. I figured so. Julie. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, so Thomas, could you please uh, just uh, lightly touch on the categories that you can deduct from your home office? So I know that you can deduct a certain percent, not only the space, but utilities. Um, yeah. Can you so deduct you, landscaping and security? Yeah, so the so the landscaping portion of it's like contentious. So you could you can deduct mostly, you could, you're basically supposed to be able to deduct uh, all the a portion of all the expenses related to your entire home, like utilities. Um, I, I would make an argument that you could do secure that you could do security. I don't have um, a defin I don't have any like tax court cases on the top of my head that are like going to be able to d debate that or like uh, debunk that. But typically, you're able to deduct uh, a portion of your mortgage interest or your rent, your repairs, maintenance, utilities, insurance, property taxes. And depreciation. Now, interestingly, the costs associated specifically with your home office itself, like so, say, say for example, it's my home office, right? If I bought this this desk, um, I'm not going to prorate this desk, right? I'm not going to prorate if my window broke over there. I'm not going to prorate that window by my entire by. Okay, like, uh, I'm going to deduct the entire window for the home office. But like, say your home office, um, say your home office represented twenty five percent of your house, right? You had a huge home office. Or a really small house, um, twenty five percent of your mortgage interest, insurance, rent, you know, rent if you didn't have a mortgage, uh, utilities, repairs, maintenance related to your entire house can be deducted. Um, that's one way to do. It. That's the actual expense method. Um, the other way to do it is just you take five dollars per square foot of your home office up to twenty up to uh, uh, th what is it three hundred square feet for a total deduction of fifteen hundred dollars. So that's the simple way to do it. But the actual way is you take the percentage of your home office as it relates to like basically you divide your square feet of your home office by the square footage of your house. And that gives you a ratio. That ratio, say 25%, you're now able to deduct 25% of the total cost associated with your home. Landscaping, though, interestingly, there's a tax court case where people uh, debated whether or not you could deduct landscaping. And I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, ta the taxpayer was basically arguing, I've had patients coming to my house. Right. If you have patients coming to your house, you need to have your house being presentable. Landscaping is part of it. Patience. So I don't want to give a definitive answer on that one because it's it's a little bit up for debate. So, well, like uh, if I have business partners at my property and I feed them, I mean, we cook in the kitchen, we sit in the living room, uh, in the dining room, and eat. That square footage is larger than my office, but we still have to use it in order so, to con you know continue business during the day. So, so let me, let me, so, um, so this, so the home, one of the requirements of the home office is it needs to be, uh, the space needs to be used exclusively for business. So oh, for example, like this office right here, I, I exclusively use it for business. No one really comes in here. It's not like my living room. It's not my, uh, mm -hmm. it's not my, um, you know, uh, kitchen. kitchen or anything like that. Yeah. Right. Um, I get it now. exclusively yeah. the definitive work. Thank you. Yeah. Great, great, great information there. Um, Thank you. However, when you go to sell this house, you are going to get hit with that, right? As there's some, for the value. Yeah, there's some there. There's a portion that you're going to depreciate. Uh, it's considered depreciation. So depreciation recapture is not going to be mitigated on the sale of your property. But if I'm being you know, if I'm being honest, it's it's usually not that big. It's it's. I, I would it would not prevent most people from taking a home office deduction. Is it worth taking the home office? So it depends, right? Uh, it actually, mm -hmm. actually, this is actually a great question. Okay, this is a great question. So uh, the home office, you cannot take the home office deduction if you have a loss. You can only take the, the home office deduction itself to the extent that you have income from the associated business. So if you're in rental real estate and that's your primary business and it's generating a lot of losses, you can't take the home office deduction, but you want to take it anyway. Um, even though you can't take, the, you want to claim the home office anyway, and that's because it makes your home office a place of business. Um, so for the via, for the purposes of the vehicle deduction, right? So say you you get in your car. Uh, so if you get in your car and you drive from your home to say Home Depot for business purposes, or you drive to your rental property for business purposes, that would be considered a personal commute. But when you have a home office, 
your first your personal commute is from your bedroom or wherever to your home office and then your home from your home office to uh the business place of business the the um what am i trying to say the uh the home depot wherever for business purposes now that's a business commute uh so that's why you'd want to have a home office even if you can't claim the deduction so um there's some more nuances to it than that but i mean that that the big picture the big the big idea is that that's the big idea of it amazing all right thomas if somebody wanted to get a hold of you to uh, continue this conversation to give you business to have them do for you to do their um wealth strategy or something along those lines what's the best way to contact yeah. you so the best way to, if you, if you want to get that conversation started, be going to therealestatecpa.com and uh, there's a big get started button right on the page. You can click that button and you can fill out a form and we'll we'll follow up with you and we'll get a co consultation scheduled. Or you can go to Thomas, excuse me, or you could go to uh, therealestatecpa.com slash Thomas and it's pretty much a similar form. But yeah, that's pretty much the best way to get in contact. And people can work with you to put together a wealth strategy yeah so we we have a team of advisors uh all really well versed in everything we talked about today and um basically what they do is they're going to look at your situation and what you have going on today as well as what your plans are for the foreseeable future and gonna come gonna tell you here's the strategies we're gonna recommend you use here's what they are here's what the benefits are Here's how you need. Here's what you need to do to implement them into your situation, and uh, then they give you a blueprint that summarizes everything. So basically, if you work with us, we're gonna show you exactly what you need to do to minimize taxes for your specific situation. Okay, and this is Hall CPA guys. So they've been generous with at Zoom at eight to help us to help you. Um, help support our industry experts like Thomas Castelli with Hall CPA. Thomas, thank you. Uh, so appreciate all your time and energies that you've given to our audience. And we hope to give you business and support you uh, like you've supported us. Really do appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you.